20% of all science spending globally in the West, 20% of all our time as scientists needs to be given for democracy. Mm. It will ask a lot of us, but I think the reward, not losing democracy, is the highest achievement, the highest gift that science can aspire to. It's more worth than all the Nobel Prizes that have ever been given and will ever be awarded. Whether it's vaccine mandates or shutting down nuclear power plants, more and more of our democratic decisions have a scientific underpinning. And so it's natural to wonder whether our democratic institutions can continue to function without a well-informed, scientifically literate and engaged population. That's what this conversation is about today. I speak with Johannes Vogel, who's a German botanist and director of the Natural History Museum here in Berlin. He sees the role of his museum as being eminently political. It's a place for debates, for depolarizing society, and for championing citizen science. He argues that there was once a time when politicians could do their politics and scientists their science. But that time is over. It's time to build a new relationship between science, policy, and society. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast, supported by the Andrew von Braun Foundation. If you enjoy these conversations, the best way you can help support me is by liking, subscribing, and sharing. And now, here's Johannes Vogel. I hope you enjoy. Escape Sapiens. So let's start with the big question first. Why is citizen science, why is open science important for liberal democracies? And what role do museums play in that game? Mm -hmm. So, first and foremost, daily we are being bombarded with news that have a scientific underpinning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, through the last few days we had the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, reporting about the urgency of political action against this looming catastrophe. So that's what we are being bombarded with nearly every day. Be it the hopeful messages that we will soon have electricity from fusion or that Earth is going to hell, climate hell. So more and more democratic decisions in democratic governments and democratic states depend on a type of knowledge of how science derives that evidence by the electorate. And in the last 50 odd years in the West, we had a very comfortable coalition between the politicians and the scientists. So the scientists did their science and the politicians did their policy. And the electorate was relatively happy because the shared myth is that there's infinite growth. Now suddenly, even so it was predicted in at least 1972, uh, 1972, that there are limits to growth, we are beginning to feel them. So now, a new relationship between science, policy, and society need to be formed. And the basis for that has to be a particular type of scientific literacy. And this scientific literacy, to me, is understanding science as a process, mm. not as a eureka moment. And again, science is not learning. We celebrate Nobel laureates every year. Are they exciting people? Have they done great things? Fantastic. Is it them? No, it's pyramids of people, extant or in the past, who have contributed knowledge so that one person who is honored with a Nobel Prize can scoop that prize. There has been a huge process with hundreds and thousands of people and pyramids of knowledge and effort to contribute to this one thing. Is that what is celebrated? No. When NASA throws 
a fridge at an asteroid. You read in the news that this is NASA's doing, that there are at least 80 different organizations who contributed to that, with thousands and thousands of people, including people in this very museum, you mm. don't read about. Mm. So we do this hero-making in science. And then we complain that the electorate doesn't want to follow science when it gives certain advice in relation to viruses. Mm. So the key is how do, do we make democratic societies scientifically literate in relation to science as a process, with trial, error, hypothesis, retraction, um, experiment, failure, success. All this type of stuff we live on a daily basis, peer review, all this type of stuff, completely unknown to people out there. And citizen science, so having people being actively engaged in doing science right from the word go, what is a question? What could be a question? Is this question relevant to you? Do you want us to um, conceive experiments together that might help you to answer your questions? Look, here are the results. This is how we can jointly interpret them. This is what action and reaction may follow from this type of work. It's onerous. It is very time consuming. But what is more important to science in the West than democracy? Nothing. And science is not doing enough. It's actually failing in supporting democracy. And that I do not want to be part of. This is what this museum doesn't want to be part of. I'm really getting angry about the helplessness that science um, displays in relation to the um, issues the world is facing. Because the answer of science in the past has always been, we need more science. Mm -hmm. I would argue we need action, mm -hmm. science-based action. And in a democracy, that means you need majorities. And how do you get majorities? when you start listening to them, mm. not when you continue talking at them. That's what dictators do. That's what autocrats do. And that's not what I want to be. And that's not what science should aspire to be. So we need to become humble. We need to learn to listen. And we need to give. Mm. And thus, my plea is, 20% of all science spending globally in the West, 20% of all our time as scientists needs to be given for democracy. Mm. It will ask a lot of us, but I think the reward, not losing democracy, is the highest achievement, the highest gift that science can aspire to. It's more worth than all the Nobel Prizes that have ever been given and will ever be awarded. But so when it comes to museums specifically, since you talk about a process, when people come through the front door here in this museum, they see beautiful fossils of dinosaurs. You see um, sort of the finished product in some sense. That's, that's immediately what catches your eye. So how do you actually deliver that unglamorous side when, because it is nice to have charismatic aspects to show off, right? So. Very good point. Two things. Here, exhibit number one. So, can, I, can I just say for those listening, uh, Johannes is holding up a jaw of a what, what kind of dinosaur is this? This is a this is the lower left jaw of a T. Rex, and it's about a meter long, and about um, thirty centimeters, forty centimeters high. Um, and the teeth are serrated like steak knives and they grow out of the jaw like with sharks mm -hmm. and they could bite a Humvee in two as if it was a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. So Tristan came very short notice. Mm -hmm. First T-Rex in Europe. 
T-Rexes are found in America. They were made famous through Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park sequels. And now the first original skeleton, one of the best in the world, comes to Berlin. And we had very little time to prepare the exhibition. So if you go to most of our exhibitions, and we come to that in a minute, they tell you the story of what we know. Tristan had just come out of the earth. Other than that it was a T-Rex, we didn't know anything. So we did an exhibition about questioning. So we had our scientists as Atavars talking about what questions they wanted to address in the next few years with this specimen. It was all about questions, five questions that you could ask about this dinosaur. For example, why is it black? And so on and so forth. It was a huge success, that approach. We had a press coverage um, we haven't achieved since. In one year, we reached between four and seven billion listeners and viewers um, and readers globally on this approach. And um, that's exactly what we wanted to do, to push ourselves forward as an institute that conducts question-driven research. And what the public understands is that questions are the start of an inquiry. So that's why we put the questions in the foreground. Now, but you're absolutely right that a lot of our exhibitions talk about what we may know. But with us, it's slightly different. So we talk in our exhibitions about three different things. One is evolution of the solar system and of Earth. And I have an object to talk about that in a sec. Second is evolution of life. Third is how we as an organization evolve and change. All these three things are part of our exhibitions and of our public programs. And when you come to our exhibitions, you will see very few objects. We have very few objects. They are very nicely displayed. And when you go and see what our audience does with the way how we have devised our exhibitions is that they look at the objects and then they turn towards each other. And when they turn towards each other, they start talking with each other about what they see. And that's how our exhibitions are designed. So you have people standing 5, 10, 15 minutes around an object, pointing at different aspects and talking about it, what they see, because we are very sparse with the information. You can get any information you like from your audio guide. It's on your smartphone. You can read the text, which is hidden. It's not in front of your eyes. We empower our visitors to discuss what they see, what they are concerned. Where does that lead us to? It leads us to a globally unique visitor demography. 60% of our visitors are between 16 and 40 without children. We are not a family. We are not an old people or whatever museum. We are a political museum mm -hmm. because we have a democratic mandate and we work with our audiences listen to our audiences, discuss with our audience, and then adapt our approach in relation to their needs, aspirations, and wants. Of course, we bring our messages in as well. Otherwise, why would we run a museum if we don't have things to say? But we do it as much as we can in co-production and through the science we generate together or as standalone items. So. Um, this approach, not taking yourself too serious, listening to others, give them space for their stories and their mind, like good radio or good podcast does. Stories develop in the brain when you listen, not when you see. That's dumbing it down. So I'm a big fan of radio and podcast. Um, no time for television. Um, but um, that's how we, how we also try to, try to work with our audiences. It's their stories and they that matter. So then when it comes to listening, 
How much of a say should the public have in what sort of research is actually done at the end of the day? That's a very, very tricky question. Could I, could I just add one thing to that? Yep. So my, my background is in physics. Yes. And so a lot of the questions that I might want to ask would be difficult to, to explain to someone at the outset, right? And so it's, it's, in certain fields, I can imagine it would be quite difficult to get advice from the citizenry with regards to which direction to go in. So I, I'm just prefacing the question with that sort of a context. No, I, I fully yeah. understand where you are coming from, and I would never, ever advocate that um, the public has to be engaged um, or have an equal say or whatever in any odd questions um, that science wants to ask. Mm. But let me give you a different take on the same thing. So last year, 2022, for my sins, I was chair of the German National Year of Science, which run under the heading, Do You Have a Question? And um, uh, yes, because I've been an advocate of participatory um, science, citizen science for so long, it was um, <laughs> no coincidence that probably they asked me to chair this, um, this science year, wouldn't they? Mm. Um, and we solicited 14,500 questions. And um, there was a citizen panel, there was a scientific panel that, that grouped these questions together, tried to make sense out of it all. And what turns out, how are the questions grouped? 75% of these questions that the public wants science to answer were in the field of health, environment, and nature. 25% um, were sort of in the more humanities field, peace, um, social justice, and so on and so forth. But all of these questions that they wanted to have answered are in fields where science can and should be open for co-creation and dialogue. Yeah? It's mm -hmm. not how to improve string theory or mm -hmm. um, yeah, create a new model of the atom or God knows what, or do some esoteric math. Yeah? It was real hands-on stuff. And then came the funny thing. The scientists then said, the established science here in German, their first reaction was, this is utterly ridiculous, because these are the questions that we are already addressing. To which my reply then was, isn't it absolutely marvelous that mm. the public regards as relevant what you are already researching? Mm. So think about the mindset. Yeah, They think they have the monopoly on what a good question is, and then get sort of shirty um, when suddenly there is a sort of um, coincidence or um, a um, similar thinking. Instead of thinking, wow, this gives me fantastic legitimacy mm -hmm. to do the stuff that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Of course, the members of parliament I spoke to immediately got it. Because funnily enough, when you read the current coalition treaty here of the German government, a lot of the issues that this current government wants to address, funnily enough, coincide with the questions the public wants to have answered. Which is no coincidence, because one would argue that in a functioning democracy, the politicians somehow have an idea how they have to address the needs, ambitions, and interests of their constituency. Mm -hmm. So, but this is, comes back to the point we've discussed earlier on. The politicians understood immediately what an opportunity this mm -hmm. set of questions was, whereas the scientists, perhaps because they were conditioned wrongly, sitting on their high horse, trying to look down at these questions with a remark like, oh, we are doing this already. Yeah. So this type of mindset has to go. It is not befitting for science in a democratic knowledge society 
to have these type of attitudes and beliefs. That is not how we are going to pull together science, society, industry um, and policy to save the one planet we have. So then when it comes to saving the one planet we have, how do you think we should break up our science investments? So uh, to preface, we at the moment are getting very excited about trips to Mars, for example, or um, you hear in the news about de-extinction of animals and things like this. So do you take those direct, because people are very excited about that, right? So, so how, how, how do you think we should uh, do our split when it comes to financing? The most important thing we find we need to finance now, and we should have financed 51 years ago when the limits of growth appeared, was to bring the majority of people in the Western democratic knowledge societies behind the transformation. I think that's the only thing now that matters. Helping democracies to stay stable in this time of change and unrest, have people engaged in dialogue why a science-based, not a faith or alternative facts-based approach, no, a science and evidence-based approach is our only hope, and really become humble, learn to listen, and spend our time with society. I think nothing else matters any longer. Because you can have the smartest ideas. If you don't have a majority, the smartest idea will not go anywhere. Right. So then, do you think... Um, so people are excited about these, you know, going to Mars and this sort of thing. So what I want to ask is... They're being made to be excited about it. So this is... By this, the media. So this is Because my, it, again, is hero making. It is the hero making approach. Scientists and media, again, play these unholy alliances and games. An easy sound, communicate an easy sound bite. Make America great. Let's go to Mars. Let's bring the dodo back. Um, all this type of stuff. It's easy to communicate. People have immediately images in their head. Mm -hmm. um, and that you can start playing with. But it detracts us from the real hard, nitty-gritty stuff we now have to do. And that is having people understand science as a process and that it is something that is not alien to them, that is not done by men in white coats and professorial titles, um, but that it is done with them, for them, and what it all means. Um, we need to completely change our way if we want to have a chance. That's my, that's my feeling. And this is where a museum like mine comes in. We, pre-COVID, were able to engage 2% of the adult population of Berlin. So Berlin has about 3 million adults, so people who have the right to vote. And 60,000 of them, every year, we were able to engage in direct dialogue around the questions of care for democracy, care for the world. We all know that 3.5% of an engaged population can mean a tipping point. Mm. So as a scientific organization, we can do it. And now comes the other issue that my scientific colleagues say. Oh, but we can't do that on top of everything else. Fair argument, one might argue. Can you thrive for excellence and can you thrive for relevance at the same time? Now, funnily enough, we've managed. The more relevant we became for Berlin and our constituency, the better our science got. I have the data to demonstrate that. And what I'm talking about here is not the efforts of a single individual. What I'm talking about here is the efforts of an organization. 
So we shifted resources in our organization. We empowered and tooled up scientists. We created a culture where excellence and relevance had to be looked at at the same time. Yes, it took years to get there, but you can get there if leadership of scientific organizations has the will to go there. So therefore, I would argue, if organizations are not there, there is no leadership towards that direction or no leadership of the organization as a whole. That's debatable, the latter statement. Yeah, so we have a real issue of science, how it is today. Hmm. How it imagines itself, how it values itself, how it rewards itself, um, and um, yeah, it's, th- it, it's not good. I suppose also if you have open science and science that is interesting to the population and is uh, active with the population, then it opens up opportunities. Because scientists today, they often complain about lack of funding, how much time it takes to apply for funding. Well, if, if you are making your science interesting and accessible to the public, then perhaps you, you will gain new avenues for research funding. So let me give you two examples that illustrate your point. Um, so I've, I've lived in the UK from, from 89 to, to 2012 and still sort of um, have, have a lot of contacts and roots there. So um, my, most of my adult, my, my adult life I spent as a scientist or as a scientific leader I spent in the UK. And there is a, um, an experimental field site called Rossumstead. They do long-term ecological experiments for over 100 years. They are looking at the change um, in soils and vegetation and fauna in particular types of managed habitats. And as you know, in the UK, um, since Thatcher, a lot of science has been restructured. And Rossumstead... Um, because they were not immediately applied science, um, we'll start thinking about when or whether they might get a call from whatever office um, to threaten their existence. So they went into a huge engagement program with the villages and communities around Rossumstead. And when the phone call came, all the communities, all the members of parliament stood up for that very scientific organization because they have made themselves part of the community. Mm. Now here in this very country, Germany, or in America, or in the UK, or in France, you will be hard pushed to name a lot of organizations who have deeply embedded themselves Mm. as excellent research organizations into the community. Mm. Now let me give you a second example. This very museum. So the managing director and I took over in 2012 and the way how we found ourselves and the agenda we agreed upon was organizational development empower the staff, um, enable them, look at the look after the institution and its people. And that gave us a fantastic foundation of, at that stage, probably around 300 ambassadors who were linked into the Berlin community, plus the, at that stage, 450,000 visitors we had. Um, to engage with us. And then when um, the T-Rex came, um, it gave us a big push. It made us more or less world famous for a while. Um, So we played the attention economy. Um, But also the communication strategy we had was very targeted. We wanted to achieve three aims with our communication strategy around the T-Rex. One is, as I've explained earlier, we do research. 
The second was, we are good for Berlin. And the third one, um, this, me, is the man who brought T-Rex to Europe so that I have political agency, blah, blah, blah. But the latter one was more of a hidden agenda. And then when the wordle came of these thousands and thousands of press coverage we got, um, Berlin and research were the two bold words. So we really had hit the nail. And that was an entry to policy. But the entry card to policy was I, A, going to them, B, inviting them to come to us. And when you invite them to us, I've asked them not to come um, before two o'clock because between 12 and two, our visitors change. So in the morning, we have family school classes. Mm -hmm. From two o'clock, we have young adults, the people everybody wants to have. So they came after two o'clock. I met them at the front door, talked to them for 10, 15 minutes, and then said, have you noticed anything? And immediately they said, you have a very interesting public coming in here because young people just streamed through the door. Anyway, so then, of course, I could immediately explain that we feel that our job is not necessarily to display natural history museum objects, but to develop and sustain the democratic knowledge society. Mm. Because that's what I ultimately really care about. Yes, I care about my ferns and their sex life, but democratic knowledge society, I think, is a bit more valuable than that. And so I started to hone the message. And they could see with their own eyes that these young politically engaged and active, economically active young adults were coming to us was uh, basically the evidence for what I was spurting out here. So I was not talking just, yeah, I mean, you hear a lot of museum directors talking about what their museums do. Um, but, you know, go and look at the evidence. And we did it the other way around. We let them discover the evidence and then hmm. put the message behind it. And so, but these young people, they do not come to us because, well, how do you become sexy for that type of group? You become sexy for that type of group of people because you do stuff that they care about. It also means you don't need an advertising budget. We don't have an advertising budget. Why? If you get 500,000 young adults, each of them connected via social media to hundreds of other people, who needs an advertising budget? Yeah? If they have a good time here. Um, and um, so then, putting forward this argument that nature is political and that we have access to people to talk about science as a process and thereby helping to develop and stabilize a democratic knowledge society. So all issues about relevance, yes, that we had to be excellent, that's just come, is part of, the, part of the job. But I spoke to them about the relevance and they could see what relevance we have to their electorate. Mm. So bang, I got the biggest pot of money Germany ever awarded to a single institution directly from the federal parliament. On, I'm a little bit curious about this, actually. I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but this building is filled with priceless objects. And you just got a big uh, grant from the government. How do you insure a building like this? It's not, it's not insurable. Okay. So... Whatever. Let's take this this object of coal here. Yeah? It comes from a coal mine. What is important to this object is not the object. It's the label. So what needs to be associated with this is what it is, where it comes from, when it has been collected, by whom, and then all the other associated information which you now can find on the web. What is in publications, what is in chemical data, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So, 
if you take all the 30 million objects in this building and throw them all without the labels into one of our courtyards, their value is zero. The other thing is, to go in the other direction, let's have a look at this object. I'm not taking it out of its case because it emits um, alpha radiation. This is the very piece of ore from which, in the year of the French Revolution, the element uranium was described. I'd say priceless. It's a unique thing. There is only one piece, well, there are actually three pieces of um, this, or all three in this building, from which the element uranium was described. Whereas this piece of coal mm. is probably a cent in material value, but if it's hard, if it has contributed to our science and understanding of science, it may add up in value. So we are basically not insured. We are not insurable. Once in a while, especially in the UK, um, <laughs> government then asked, like with art collections, um, whether we wanted to value our <laughs> collections. And um, we could answer that in, in, in London quite easily. We said, if you give us 40 million, then we can set up the framework to try to value <laughs> the collections. Mm. Um, but that's the minimum amount we would need to go anywhere near that. Now, with dinosaurs, the issue is straightforward. Um, at the moment, um, as we know, we had tons of quantitative easing. Um, banks are wobbling now because they are trying to get um, back to a more normal and sound, stable financial system. Um, but in that time of quantitative easing, money needed to find things to be invested in. And thus shares, pieces of art and dinosaurs went up. Mm. Um, pieces of art and dinosaurs roughly um, at the same rate. So now dinosaurs can be valued and are being valued because they are being auctioned. But if I were to go to Christie's and say, I have this priceless piece of coal <laughs> where one of my researchers um, 150 years ago wrote a really important paper in the annals of um, whatever, Dessau, Natural History Society, Dessau. Um, I don't think I would, get, I would get much value for it. So yeah. scientifically, because it is a scientific infrastructure and we manage it like a scientific infrastructure for science and potentially for solving the problems the world is facing. This collection is priceless. In terms of monetary value, probably the dinosaurs will fetch a few bob, but that's more or less, more or less it. But do you find then that you have to compete against private collectors? And are you finding that it's difficult to get your hands on new uh, objects, items of interest? So, Specifically with regards to the dinosaurs. Yeah, I so, so our, our new dinosaur display, which we are um, currently displaying, um, and where we talk about the extinction crisis, because they, most of them are Jurassic, so um, they were all... Um, no, they're not there. Anyway, um, most of them were, were wiped out, or a number of them were wiped out um, with, with the meteorite coming. Um, they're all privately owned. Mm -hmm. So this is a private-public partnership. Um, and we have very, very generous um, supporters here um, who have given this to us on loan, free of charge now for, for a very, very long time. Um, and we have a very good and amicable and profitable, I mean, profitable in terms of bartering um, relationship. And it's working fine, but also at the same time, because we have been so successful with um, putting privately owned dinosaurs um, on display and creating a huge attention around that, um, I think we may inadvertently have also mm. contributed to the um, craze that currently plays out at Christie's or, or other auction houses. 
I see. But that was an unintended consequence. You should develop a craze uh, about objects that you have lots of and then sell them off. <laughs> well, thing. one of the things is that um, none of the objects in this building belong to me or the museum. They belong um, to the state of Berlin. And so therefore, um, while there are certain ways how we can decommission objects, so for example, objects that do not have um, the necessary specification in relation to what it is, where it is from, when it was collected, who it was collected mm. by. Um, I mean, with 30 million objects, you always find find somewhere that where that necessary information is lacking. Um, that can be decommissioned, but other than that, it is not in our gift um, to get mm. rid of objects, either commercially nor in any other mm. in any other way. So, do you still send people out to search for items of interest? Our is collection grows by about one to two percent per year. Uh, mainly through, through insects. Um, okay. So we get between, well, up to 300,000, 600,000 insects per but, year. But are those donations, or do you specific, are you specifically no, no. looking for... We, we, we have 160 um, to 200 uh, scientists here in the building. Mm -hmm. They conduct active research, in part on collections, in mm -hmm. part on what they collect. So that mm -hmm. is the way how uh, acquisition and accession goes. But since 1992, all of this under firm legal frameworks internationally and bilaterally um, that govern um, biological or paleontological uh, material. So um, since the Rio Convention, um, the free times go and raid and pillage um, are over. Mm -hmm. So everything that is here hopefully is legal. Everything in the building today is? Hopefully legal. So so what happens then when questions come up surrounding the legitimacy or the ownership of items in the building? Because uh, this is a big question that's currently being asked about museums uh, today. Yes. Um, so, um, I mean, um, one of the first things um, that Stefan Juncker, managing director, and I did, basically in the same year we started, 2012, was to set up a um, um, humanities um, um, program here to help us to understand the historical, political, and cultural, and sociological um, implications and um, ramifications of our collections. Mm -hmm. So um, we are probably we probably have the most advanced program, um, research program, scientific program um, on these. On these topics now especially for natural history museums but i think also for museums in in general i mean the other big push in germany of course was looted art during the nazi era so um mm. a lot of research went into that but um yeah um apart from that um i think we are we are pretty much ahead of it so we have a very very good view of what we have and we are very in very close um or in in parts, we are in close discussion, um, especially with African, um, with uh, people from African countries, and we run a big program called the Museums Lab, which is a um, academy for joint learning and unlearning of imagination and um, ideas about museums and collections. Um, it's 50-50. Um, Fellows from Europe, fellows from from the African continent. Um, it's paid for by the Foreign Office, the um, um, office, uh, the the Ministry for um, International Collaboration, and the um, Culture Ministry in Germany. And we do it on behalf of of Germany. And um, the interesting thing is that um, a lot of the fellows that apply from Europe want to talk about. Um, colonialism want to talk about how to address these issues and um, the fellows from Africa um, want to talk to a large degree majority about um, how to um, jointly shape the future and work mm -hmm. together um, so um, yeah it's it's very interesting so the debate in Europe has taken a certain turn and it may not always reflect the wishes of other other parts mm -hmm. of the world. That is again, as we spoke earlier, on you develop certain bubbles 
in science and certain imaginations and then you they become self-fulfilling mm-hmm. um, and so the museum lab is actually really really good because so the people from Europe um, mm. skin color like you and me go in with a certain imagination and suddenly they're being confronted by how can we jointly shape the future oh mm. that's what you want yeah so mm-hmm. uh, it's it's quite interesting it's a big learning um, exercise for all concerned it's not surprising to me at all um, because one of the things that is in my opinion quite particular about nature is that uh, nature has been there before we invented any political system the national state is an outcome of the 30 year war and the treaty that followed the 30 year war um, so the national the nation state is not even 500 years old mm. and um, nature is 3.8 billion years old so um, while I can fully understand that a certain community wants their ancestral remains or their cultural artifacts back um, I think it would be a bit harder um, for a community let's say, in Greece or Turkey to argue that they want their flies back um, <laughs> because a when you collect flies in Turkey or Greece there are millions of them left mm. <laughs> because biological organisms have this really unnatural habit of multiplying and procreating mm. um, and um, yeah especially with flies the thing is you may be happy if a few of them are going and not buzzing around your ears but anyway so um, yeah nature and politics is intertwined but um, ownership of nature I think is one of the issues that really plagues us um, and um, so the debates are not that hot in natural history on repatriation and um, colonialism the issues are there definitely so in the global natural history collections we estimate that about 20 percent of the collections come from the global south and have mm-hmm. colonial um, so to speak heritage but um, to me the more surprising um, conclusion out of that fact is how little we actually know about the part of the world where most of mm. nature's diversity is and that is mm. the global south so the last two three hundred years have not really yielded us with an understanding of the beauty and diversity of nature if we only have so little mm. from the south and that to me is a call to arms so to speak or a rallying call to find new ways to work together mm-hmm. to address this shortcoming, address it now, address it fast. Um, and that is why I'm so pleased that what comes out of the museum's lab is, at least from the fellows we engage with in Africa, and they are all leaders in their field across the cultural and natural science museum sector, that they are exactly interested in this coming mm-hmm. together, addressing these issues. So I suppose your point with regards to the the flies in in Greece is that the museum itself generates the value, the scientific value behind many of these items. And so in that sense, it's it's not clear that the majority of the objects should return or would even be wanted. Um, So the, the... Whether or not objects should be returned is a question that in this country the German government has to address. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it would... I do have an opinion about this, um, but that is my opinion. Um, The decision on that lies completely somewhere else. But the value to the fly is given through the scientific study that has been conducted Mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. That would be my argument. Mm -hmm. So with a cultural artifact, you can see that the value creation comes out of the community that has sourced the material, that has put their craft into it, that has put their meaning and value into it. 
And to a certain degree, with a fly in our collection, you can see the same process happening here, but after the extraction of the mm. object. Mm. I see. So then the other thing is that we are trying to separate our democracies from uh, ethnic belonging, let's say. We, we, we no longer base our notion of the nation state on ethnicity or race. We're, we're, we're sort of breaking away from that. So in some sense, you could also ask the question of, of why uh, people living in a certain location have more claim of ownership of objects. I'm t not talking about the flies now. I'm talking about um, objects, for example, in Egypt, where, where the population is many thousands of years divorced from. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do, does this sort of an idea come up? Uh, um, these are all very pertinent points to these type of debates. But, um, you know, one of the things that I've learned is, and we, we've spoken earlier about what co-creation means and co-production and open and citizen science. One of the things that is important in all of this is to value different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And you would get on the question you've asked lots of different perspectives. Mm. And um, then in the end, you would probably have to negotiate around these topics. And then you need to have to come to a conclusion. Um, so that's a, that's a question. How long is a piece of string, mm. basically? Yeah, you can have my opinion on it, um, but that's just one of many perspectives hmm. on these on these far-ranging and wide topics. Yes, sometimes, however, as you may know, I mean, the UK is this odd, odd population of thousands of years of migration. I mean, the UK was uninhabitable um, at the height of the Ice Age, so in the last 18,000 years, waves and waves of migrants have moved onto this island that has been an island probably I don't know that's in for the last 10,000 years or whenever whenever the channel broke um, but they did find didn't they some um, some genetic links between some fairly way back fossils and um, and local and local populations I think somewhere near Bristol or something like that so there may well be a link um, between modern Egyptians and um, the people who built built the pyramids. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, please let not forget that the two of us are related to Cleopatra as well, um, <laughs> like every other human mm. on the planet, because there have been a few generations past, and the one or the other little piece of DNA from Cleopatra should mm. be somehow in mm. us. So perhaps... Um, we have a claim to Egyptian heritage as well through her um, fecundity. Mm. On, on the other hand, the Brandenburg tour, the, uh, the statue on top was taken to France at some point and that made yes. people quite cranky here. Um, yeah, but yeah, what? It's her pride. Mm. If Napoleon would have taken flies. <laughs> and the other thing is, I mean, I, I, I admire France for a lot of things, you know, mm. Now, um, Louvre Abu Dhabi is going to be built. I mean, lots of the French collections that they're now franchised around the world mm. are collections that have been amassed through mm. war and revolution. Mm. Um, I mean, let's go into the origin of that lot. Um, mm. I mean, that the Quadriga came back is one of the very few things mm. that came back. Not everything mm. came back. Mm. So then you mentioned there are 30 million items in in collection here when when you say that how many of those are actually labeled explored that's what? the ones that are labeled and explored okay and, and so there are ones that are in boxes in addition or well how does what this... is 30 million objects so here um this one of my prized specimens is evidence for natural climate change so we should explain what this is <laughs> what is it it's a test tube a glass test tube with a cork um, from the year 1859 because here in this very building we had the first microbiologist um, Ehrenberg and so um, when they dug up dirt um, south of Greenland um, in the ocean um, and they removed the biological material from that dirt um, it came here 
and a hundred odd years later it was used to demonstrate Milankovic cycles, um, this 110 year cycle um, through the slight change of the Earth axis that um, leads to um, um, ice ages um, and, and massive climate change. So there's man-made climate change we are in at the moment and there's a underlying natural climate change that is now um, basically being pushed into insignificance by the human impact. Um, and this is the evidence for natural climate change. Mm. And in this very tube here, which is probably in our catalog listed as one, uh, are probably 10,000 diatom specimens. Mm -hmm. So if you go into our microbial collection, <laughs> um, how many specimens do I have? We have entire beasts here in alcohol, mm. um, be it fish, be it reptiles. There are tens of thousands or even, well, with you and me, at least two kilograms of us in our gut is microbes, of which there are probably 10,000 or 100,000 or God knows how many species. So if I would be part of this collection, am I one or am I 500 million because, or 5 billion because that's the amount of bacteria and fungi and viruses and God knows what I have in my guts, you know. So, I mean, with this, it's fairly easy. Yeah, yeah? that's one piece of rock, that's one specimen. This, is it one or is it 10,000, yeah. a tube? Yeah, so 30 million is what we've catalogued, plus minus. I guess what I... I want to sort of understand is there's more that we haven't cataloged yeah no, no, no. So, so what i want to understand is you must have vast collections of birds say or, yeah. or beasts you call them so uh, if you just look at that as a single item what percentage of those are understood and categorized what percentage of those has a scientist actually looked at and used uh, at some point ah so looked up and used at one point that's not our point, actually, mm. funnily enough. I would argue more and more that we are an insurance policy for the world. I view our collection and the job that we have to do as we have the answers to questions that we haven't even asked. Mm -hmm. So this dirt here, south of Greenland, was not collected to give evidence for natural climate change. Milankovic was probably even, was not even born. The man who coined, who, who discovered it, the cycles. But when the scientific question arose, one could go to these collections and they can help to provide the evidence for the questions one has asked. That's how I see our collection. So our collection is not there, that they are in their entirety being researched. But if you have a question, and if we have provided digital access to all we have, which we should have by 28, we will be probably the first museum that will have been able to provide total digital access to a global massive collection. That's all part of this money that I got from Parliament and uh, Parliament Berlin and Parliament uh, Germany to do that, to be the first. Then, with help of machine learning, AI, and lots of other clever natural brains, we can interrogate the collection for what the world needs or you as a scientist want to know. And one of the things how we started this in proper analog form is that a few years back we had this book published of a hundred objects that we think are significant and interesting and fun. And the thing is that this is not a book written by me as a director. It's a book written by a hundred authors, everything from visitors to children 
to artists, to scientists, because everybody has a perspective. So this is the same philosophy. One object that was here originally by Ehrenberg used to describe the plankton that um, creates the oxygen we breathe. And he named all of these oxygen-giving organisms, were then 120 years used later in the most cited scientific paper um, to describe, give evidence for natural climate change. So these are two completely different perspectives. Mm. And there will be many more perspectives. And you, if you look at these microbes, um, at these diatoms and algae, you see these beautiful, beautiful structures that inspired Jugendstil mm. through Ernst Heckel. Yeah, so that's the third perspective on the same type of stuff. Mm. And this is described in this book. And on the top of the book, um, on the front and on the back, you see a really horrible creature. <coughs> Says he as a botanist. It's a dried fish. And this is also how collections come about. So in the early 1900, 1800 and a bit, a Russian ship with German scientists sailed to Japan. It was a joint exhibition. Russia and Germany had always a really good relationship. It stopped in uh, 41 and hasn't recovered since. Um, and I think the current political uh, situation won't do much um, to get that relationship improved again. Anyway, so at that stage, um, uh, Prussia and Russia um, were, were quite closely linked. And so German scientists traveled on a Russian exhibition. And you couldn't go to Japan mainland. So they had floating islands, and ships had to moor on these floating islands. And the naturalists wanted to have a look at Japan's nature, but they couldn't set foot on land in Japan, because Japan at that stage was still closed. Anyway, they managed to have people bring them fish from the Japanese markets, mm. but not all of them were eaten. Mm. So they were dried as scientific specimens. So this is basically a triangulation between a closed society like Japan and two collaborating open societies, mm -hmm. or scientifically open societies, Germany and Russia, at that time. So these are the odd human, cultural, historical and or scientific stories our collections have. And the important thing for us is to value how many perspectives mm -hmm. can be put at these at these objects. And this book um, is actually a fun read telling you a hundred stories. But what I basically say is we have 30 million objects and the easiest thing were to say, that means 30 million stories, I'd say infinite number of stories, if you really were to go into it. If I was gonna press you for your perspective, do you actually have an item or a set of items in the museum that are your favorite, that are particularly meaningful for you? Well, uranium, um, this piece of uranium, I like a lot um, and I request a lot from the collection um, for events like this, but also a lot of other things. Um, yeah, lately I was asked um, how museums, natural history museums, globally are actually measured. So, in a, in a way, the question was, where do you rank yourself? Hmm. And I would give you the same answer that I gave then. You can find lots of ways. Who has the most specimens in their collection? Smithsonian, 140 million. Who has the most visitors, either Smithsonian, London or New York, between five and seven million? Um, who has the most scientists? Who has the most grant in aid? Who has the most something like that? It's all fine. Um, yes, can't compete with any of that. But what I would argue about us is that we are the most political of all natural history museums. The funding structure we are in, um, and the city I'm in, Berlin, which is a very political system, uh, and a very political city, not party political, just political, mm. um, gives me a lot of license mm. 
mm-hmm. to be political. And the most, there are two items that are, for me, the most political. One is uranium here, that is on equal par with Archaeopteryx. Why is Archaeopteryx, which I can't get out of our collection because it's firmly screwed into our exhibitions. Archaeopteryx is a specimen of a dinosaur that was found, a flying dinosaur that was found in uh, Bavaria in the um, 1850s. And as we all know, 1859, Charles Darwin published the book The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And his hypothesis was that um, there's no creation, but gradual evolution. And this gradual evolution takes time. And Earth history has provided us with the time for this slow process Mm. to happen. And the criticism that came straight away was, where on Earth are actually organisms that show us your transition, your transformation of organisms or evolution? Um, There are none. I can see a cow, I can see a fish, but I can't see a mermaid, Hmm. basically, or whatever. Yeah? Yeah. And two years after he published The Origin of Species, the first proper Archaeopteryx came out. Hmm. And Archaeopteryx was the first proper fossil evidence that showed elements of modern birds and of dinosaurs Hmm. in a specimen. Hmm. So it basically provided evidence for the most fundamental paradigm shift we had because it took humans out of the center of the world. Mm. And that was, through the evidence, Archaeopteryx Mm -hmm. provided. So, but that again is a fundamental political, sociological, social issue that we throw God out of our lives. And this is why I think that what we do as natural history museums is eminently political. So can I ask then the uranium sample, when you say that's political, this is because of the recent decision of Germany to switch off its power stations? No. Or what, what's the, what, what is the... Uranium. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the atomic bomb. Mm-hmm which has become talked about in the last 13 months again, hasn't it? Of course, yeah. Atomic energy, yes. Mm. How do you get an energy system completely fucked up because you want to have plutonium for your nuclear bombs? Mm. The destruction of communities, the pollution of oceans and landscapes through uranium mining, and so on and so forth. Um, And of course, the rivalry between nation states hmm. for for nothing. And the idea of mutually assured destruction. I mean, th- think about all these perversities mankind can come up with just because um, we discovered uranium. Hmm. I mean, yes, I mean, I'm not saying that uranium would have been described and discovered eventually, because like all the other elements, it would have done eight elements, eight of the um, 90 or whatever, 95 naturally occurring elements in the world were described here in Berlin. Mm. And uranium is is one of them. Mm. All, by a, all by a single man, Klopstock. Talking about the current political climate, so currently in Ukraine, th- there's conflict, there's a war. I know that during the Second World War, this museum was hit with a bomb or multiple bombs. Yes. And uh, the very part we are sitting in. The very part we're sitting in. Mm. So this was all destroyed, leveled, where we. Um, Yeah, next door. Yep. Yep. So so I have two sort of questions that I'm curious about uh, with with regards to this. The, The first is Is this museum offering assistance to museums in Ukraine to protect their collections? So, um, 
we have very good um, collaborations with a number of um, Ukrainian colleagues. We got in touch with them immediately. The issue is what to do. So they didn't really know what was unfolding around them, where it would all end. Mm. We didn't know either. So we became quite um, reflective. We try to help them with what they thought they needed at that time. That's the best we could do. So we are here in Germany. So certain bureaucratic processes needed to be put in motion in order to make certain actions legal. Hmm. At the same time, lots of buses came to Berlin, bringing family and refugees, driving back empty, which always offers the opportunity to perhaps provide the one or the other parcel mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to go to Ukraine. Um, and then later on, it became legal to do things like that. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that now here in this very building, Can I just, have, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. So by that you mean that you were supplying assistance? Uh, what they thought they needed. Mm -hmm. Not us thinking what they need. They said, this is what we need. And as we have here in this very building, a supply for emergencies. I see. Mm -hmm. um, we emptied our stores, rebought it, mm -hmm. um, but gave it to Ukraine because that's where the emergency was. I see. Yeah. We have outside of this building an emergency store supply because if you have it in the building, if there is a fire, mm -hmm. what good does it do if you have an emergency <laughs> supply? Yeah, So we have containers outside of this building with our emergency supplies. Um, and they went, uh, I think, quite to a substantial degree to Ukraine. I do not know because this is what my team does. Um, they know that they are authorized to do this type of stuff so it doesn't go over my desk because it would produce another bottleneck mm -hmm. for swift action. So mm -hmm. that's not how we operate. Um, the other thing is that um, a number of scientists came here. Um, as you know, men over under 60 are not allowed to um, leave, Ukraine. leave Ukraine. So um, we have an elderly couple here, um, both very highly esteemed entomologists, um, and he's over 60, and they both have been generously supported by the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung and the Philipp Schwarz initiative, so they both have quite generous stipends to live and work here. We've also um, supplied financial assistance um, where we could, um, and we are still in close contact with, with our colleagues there. Um, the collections... Um, the valuable collections in the Ukraine um, were not allowed to leave mm -hmm. the Ukraine. Some colleagues um, wanted to come and bring their collections here for safekeeping, um, but they were not allowed by the government. And I have certain sympathy um, mm -hmm. for that type of approach. Um, yeah, it's it's a tricky it's a tricky decision. It really is. Um, During the Second World War, a lot of the collections in this building were evacuated mm -hmm. um, or certain safety measures were put into place. But the wing we are in here, the East Wing, um, housed a lot of the whale specimens and um, some other valuable stuff. And that was all obliterated when the, when the bomb came in February. Um, 45. Was that because whales are large and difficult to yeah, move? Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't have moved them. You couldn't have moved them. There were probably tens or hundreds of tons of material. I see. Um, so another question is, which directly follows, is you, you mentioned that mu this museum in particular is political. And so one would wonder when the Nazis were in power, whether there were items that were deliberately destroyed or whether they're in, in other circumstances, under other circumstances. I don't think, th so I see this museum as being political. Um, I don't think it ever understood itself to be political. Mm -hmm. 
uh, like a lot of other cultural institutions, we rather see ourselves as apolitical. Mm. Now, in the climate and biodiversity emergency, and thereby the emergency for us as humans, um, we have to be political. Mm-hmm. Not party political. It has to be science-based, but it has to be political. Mm-hmm. Um, and political for us means opening our knowledge, our space, our convening power to a science-based dialogue on the issues. Mm. That's what, for me, it means to be political. To give you an example, early, early, late October last year, on a Sunday, I was, um, I, I was able to get away, having a nice walk in some woodlands east of Berlin um, with my wife. And we are both botanists, so we were both enjoying a bit of botanizing. And then we were talking about these attacks by um, climate activists on art objects. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, sooner or later they're going to come to glue themselves to some of our stuff. And we already have the plans um, how to deal with that. Um, the, the protocols is all written up. It's communicated to, to the staff. Um, better be prepared than, than sorry. And then my wife Sarah says, do you know that Knut, this prized polar bear, um, is, is without a glass cover? Imagine they throw red paint at him or it. And I said, oh, oh, I didn't know about that. Anyway, so we were talking about it. And then the phone rang. <laughs> and my, uh, my front of house manager, Steffi Kretschnevsky, says, um, they've just glued themselves to the dinosaurs. Can you please come back? Or can, can you please come? And I said, oh, well, about one and a half hours. Um, about one and a half hours um, if I leave now. Um, so um, I came back and police was here, had them in custody and all this type of stuff. Museum was already fully functioning again uh, because we, we decided not to close. Um, anyway, so then the next day, big booha with the press. Also, the mayor was in the building at that time day um so we had a chat about that um and so i went in front of the national press and national television and said this issue about the climate emergency is something we have been researching on we have been having dialogue science-based dialogues on and i would invite everybody policy um, politicians the climate activists the um craftsmen who are annoyed for not getting to work the mothers Mm -hmm. the pensioners whatever to come and debate. And eight days later, on national television, 90-minute live debate with all the people mm-hmm. involved on that very topic. And then now, just a few days ago, the very spots where they glued themselves to the railings of the dinosaurs have now been turned into a little exhibition. We haven't um, uh, removed the traces the exhibition is actually called Traces. So we are talking about what has happened in that very dinosaur hall. That is what I mean by being political, talking about the issues, opening up room for dialogue, debate, and perspectives. That's what I mean by political. Do you think the fact that you work with a sort of open science perspective is protective in the sense that they could have glued themselves directly to the fossils. They could have, uh, there were were far more damaging places they could have glued themselves to. Do do you think because of your, the open nature of this uh, institution that led to sort of a less destructive decision of of the activists or? We can go even further. So when the public debate was announced, and national television came, we had the police in because they were really seriously thinking that this could go absolutely pear-shaped. And they said, we want to control entrance, we want to control this evening. Mm. So again, Steffi said, no way. The people who run this place from the public side is me 
and the director. That's it. You can come in here, you can help us, but we have the power here in this building. We are not giving away our responsibility. And then a serious amount of activists came in. And they had placards and, yeah. There was, a, there was some nerves. There were some nerves. <laughs> the other part, the other side, the concerned citizens were there as well. Hmm. Not as obvious, but they were there. Hmm. We knew that. So you had the spectrum mm -hmm. there. And all of them, during that debate that was quite heated, behaved very dignified. It was the space and, as you say, probably the way how we act that took the tension out of the evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The police did not control the entrance, which would have caused chaos. People would have felt rejected, either from the... Yeah, whatever spectrum or the other side, you know? So let's not go there. Mm. We are a political but ideologically relatively neutral space as long as it's based on science and evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we allow space for debate and perspective. It is tough. But as you say, I think at this moment, in this political climate in Germany, it is rewarding. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure whether in America this would be still the case when you look at how far polarization has has gone there. But again, as long as humanly possible, we will try to have that open, respectful approach. And mm -hmm. at this moment, it's serving us extremely well. Mm -hmm. So this is extremely localized, but more generally, you really see the, the function of the, of the museum as depolarizing society as well, producing stability and basing things in fact and logic and science. Yeah, yeah. but having a space for debate around these issues as well. Can I ask then, how far does open science go? So I, I imagine if I, as a scientist, if I wanted to gain, gain access to some of the collection, yeah. I would have to lodge an application. I would have to state my goal and the reason why I'm interested. Yeah. Does this also extend to members of the public? So, yeah. so as a member of the public, someone can come in and say, yeah. I, I need a shearwater um, yep. carcass or I need a... I want... No, well, you can, under supervision... Um, conduct your scientific inquiries or your inquiries. So if you're an artist, mm -hmm. for example, and you want to make drawings, um, of course you would get access. Mm -hmm. I see. And if and you want to say, I want to conduct a satanic ritual <laughs> um, whereby part of the animal gets destroyed or eaten by me, you may not necessarily get our permission, if you see mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm-hmm. But if you have a valid reason, as a citizen, as an artist, as a scientist, as whatever, you will, we will endeavor to give you access to that collection. Um, of course, time, whatever resources, yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. For normal inquiries, it's all right. I mean, if you have a commercial interest, we may charge you. Mm -hmm. But that's just the rules of the game. And so who signs off when a scientist wants to do some destructive analysis? So, for example, uh, with the Judean date palm, for if, if there were some seeds here that someone wanted to plant and try to yeah. uh, grow, do you sign off? Who's in charge of that? So, theoretically, um, the managers of the collections mm -hmm. make that assessment. Um, but for some issues, um, I suspect they would ask me eventually. Is there an example? Can't recall at the moment. Um, yeah. I mean, not that long ago, two or three years ago, the dentist visited Tristan 
Um, the, the T-Rex. The T-Rex, which is a priceless specimen in private ownership. And, of course, we agreed um, with the owner that the dentist could come to look at stable isotopes in the teeth. Um, and um, if Tristan or any other T-Rex would have been in the ownership of this museum, of course, I would have given permission for a hole to be drilled in one of his or her teeth. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I wouldn't call destructive sampling. If you were to ask me now whether you can pulverize this piece of ore here to um, see how many other isotopes of uranium are in there and you need to centrifuge the whole thing, um, I may not necessarily give you permission for that because mm. I probably would argue go to that site, find a similar piece of mm. rock which should still be lying around, just use mm. some brawn to get it and uh, grind that one up. <laughs> mm. We can tell you where it's from. Go ahead and find it yourself. Outside of open science and citizen science, how much, do you get much time to do your own research? Oh, and long, long gone. Long gone. I, I when had, I took this job, um, I had a research lab. Well, I had two labs. I had a citizen science team and I had a evolutionary biology team when I came here and both of them um, were left to their own devices and they did extremely well without me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back to the collection then, how do you prioritize, you have limited resources and I imagine that over time taxidermy specimens, uh, valuable specimens do degrade. So how do you prioritize and sort of do triage on what gets the work, where you spend your funding um, an impossible question to answer. An impossible question to answer. So, at the moment, we are expending a lot of treasure on getting our bird collection sorted. We have about 11,000 mounted bird specimens um, and another 250,000 um, um, in, in drawers. And uh, especially the mounted specimens is um, a real um, treasure trove of human imagination. Um, but um, in order for them to still be there, um, they had to be heavily poisoned over the last 150 years. And um, also they accumulated a lot of unhealthy dust and particles um, because the air wasn't always as clean as it is mm. now. So um, we are spending a lot of treasure basically getting the dirt sucked out of their feathers um, or blown out of their feathers, which creates a hazardous waste that needs to be disposed of um, under firm EU and German regulations, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, so there we've made the decision to do it. Then we have a vast collection of snails, hardly anything that needs to be done to them. You mm -hmm. know, Dinosaurs. Lots of fossils have pyrite. Um, humidity changes, temperature changes, very dangerous for them. Um, so um, it's a judgment the organization has to make. Um, we are, while we have a huge amount of funding as a one off, uh, we are completely underfunded. Um, mm. Similar organizations our size have at least four times as much grant and aid. Mm -hmm. um, that we have, it's just part of our history coming out of the GDR um, and out of the Humboldt University that we... Um, so we were the National Natural History Museum of Germany from 1810 to the 9th of November 1990. And then we became a city museum and um, the funding we were given at that stage was city funding museum and while it has um, doubled or tripled since then, it's still um, a per specimen. We are still the the we still have the lowest grant in aid um, of all natural history museums worldwide. So um, the average a natural history museum gets per specimen uh, as grant in aid is about one euro fifty to one euro eighty. Which is nothing really and well if you have 30 million items and we we are by less than 50 cent uh, can i stop you and ask the entrance fee to, yeah. to enter yeah 
What does that actually mean in terms of It your helps us to structure our visitors. Mm-hmm. But so, it, that doesn't go at all towards... It's not, it's, I imagine it's simply not enough. Um, um, so, uh, funnily enough, we are subsidizing visits to the museum. Mm-hmm. Um, we are a public-facing institution. That's why I get grant in aid. Um, we do make money from, from entrance fees. But um, in Germany, um, we are a foundation, a public, mm-hmm. a public trust, and thus we are running on a model called um, deficit funding. So that means that somebody puts a finger in the air and says, you as an organization get this amount of money per year. And 10% of whatever that sum is, you now need to earn. Mm-hmm. So. In a way, like us, if you get 20 million, then your grant in aid is 18. And then the visitor, the entrance fee, helps you to make up the 2 million. Or overheads on grants and so on and so forth. So that's how the system works. I see. So it's almost not possible to have a free entrance to the museum under the current... Well, then I would have to ask for a significant uplift in grant in aid. I see. But it would not allow me to work as well as we do currently with our visitors. Mm -hmm. So, as I said, we have this um, clear structure that in the afternoons, and um, especially also in the evenings, we have a predominantly young adult audience. And like in the morning, families like to be there when there are other families. Young adults like to be there when there are other young adults. Mm. And the entrance fee keeps it that way. I see. So I'm very reluctant to give up entrance fee. The other thing is evidence-based. Um, all studies conducted on entrance fee show that if you do not charge entrance fee, the people you want to attract into your museum are still not coming. So I rather, I mean, it sounds good politically, it's a sound bite, but it's not Mm evidence-based. So I rather take the entrance fee and conduct specific programs to go to the people I want to bring into the scientific thinking or the museum. Mm -hmm. That's a much better way. So if politicians want other communities to come into the museum, they should pay for it instead of let the museums pay for it. Mm -hmm. Um, But that already seems to be a too complex thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, yeah, policy and evidence based, as we all know, is not always fully aligned. So when it comes to, back to looking after the, the exhibits, when it comes to taxidermy samples, of which you have many, is there going to be a last day in which we have a taxidermy, a taxidermy sample rather of a Tasmanian tiger? You know, do these things have a shelf life beyond which it's simply not going to be possible to display these items? No, no. no. A lot of specimens um, you can preserve um, for prosperity. I mean, okay. not for, I mean... Yeah, you know, when the bomb when the bomb comes, the mm-hmm. 500 kilo or whatever it was, incendiary or um, um, whatever came into here, yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. But apart from that, um, through climate control, uh, controlling light and controlling air humidity, you can keep them and a bit of poison here and there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's no... So, so one of the things I'm quite interested in at the moment is we have this melting permafrost and you have these wonderful... Uh, this opportunity to see um, extinct <laughs> rhinoceroses and woolly mammoths and wolves and this sort of thing. What happens to a sample like that once they are first found? Do they go directly into the freezer or how are those preserved? And- uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, we all know, and it, it should all give us sleepless nights that the permafrost in Siberia is thawing. Um, the methane release there will kill the climate um, if we are not careful. Um, 
and in this vast space tons of <laughs> mammoths and woolly rhino and god knows what um, are being lost as are, well are being thawed and they're being lost as quick as um, they are thawing up what is being collected there what is being found what is being put into trade I mean as we all know uh, mammoth ivory is is a massive uh, trade yeah. it has replaced elephant ivory to is it legal to trade yeah, yeah. and that's the yeah. reason why it's yeah. Yeah. but is it is it still as good as something that you can collect fresh from a ivory is ivory look I'm not an expert I'm a botanist <laughs> um, um, but um, it is traded very heavily mm -hmm. and um, I would say 0. 0.001 whatever one percent of what is mm -hmm. defrosting while we speak mm. will see will be seen by humans mm -hmm. let alone collected traded or even better preserved i mean this museum has a huge ice age collection because berlin is built on gravel from Scandinavia so the glaciers came to here mm -hmm. and when Berlin was built they needed material for roads and for houses and the so you basically dig into the ice age here as soon as you go down and that is all in this museum mm -hmm. so you don't need to go to Siberia you can just dig down in the courtyard of the museum and eventually you will find your mammoth I I always accidentally put too much of a positive spin onto the permafrost melting, but I. I <laughs> well, what's positive about permafrost melting? The one positive thing is we do occasionally get these samples, right? That are very well preserved. Oh, excellent! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I agree. It's it's a fantastic mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, and you know they found some silini, and they take took the seeds and they um, they, <laughs> they actually it, could yeah. grow could grow the silini. Um, and they, there's a contemporary, an extant species, um, and they could actually compare the genetic makeup between the extant and the extinct. So all fun stuff, mm. all for it. Mm. But um, <laughs> what's the point of all of this fantastic science and fantastic um, discovery and genetics? Um, if the earth warms by four or six degrees, you know, I mean, we won't be enjoying the fruits of that science any longer, I can tell you. Hmm. So are there any items then that are just impossible to display because they're either too fragile or they're a biohazard or for whatever other reason, it's just not... We have 30 million items, um, not even 10,000 are on display. And there are multiple reasons why. Um, I mean, now we've upped it. Um, as If you go into our digitized exhibition where we demonstrate how digitization is changing us as an organization, as I said, the third strand of our uh, public engagement. Um, we probably doubled the number of specimens just by having insect cases on the wall. Um, um, but, you know, there in these mass displays, it's rather the mass than mm -hmm. the one single specimen. And then you can go into our wet collection, which is just below where we sit here. But that's not an exhibition. That's a collection store that is made publicly visible and there are another 10, 20, 80,000 specimens on show. But again, it's rather the entire display that attracts the visitor. Um, some of the specimens are absolutely fantastic, um, extinct, Yangtze, um, uh, fish and so on and so forth. But, you know, yeah, um, there's enough that, that isn't on display and it will remain that way but what we are trying to do um, and it will take a little bit longer than 28 so by 2028 we hope to have an electronic catalogue and probably a large amount of our collection digitally for you to view mm -hmm. but you know you don't want to see 15,000 <laughs> bees with a yellow bum you really do not I mm -hmm. can tell you and if you do, I don't know, get a knife. <laughs> <laughs> or all the tens of thousands of Ice Age artifacts that were dug up in Berlin. I mean, you may be able in 10 years' time to see them all on the web, mm. but good luck if you have the time and the energy to do it. I would rather have machines going through it and try to find out 
Well, how pieces. big is the team that are doing this, that are taking the pictures? The digitization of the is about 200. You got 200, and they're working full time yeah. on across the, and, and yeah. it's going to take until 2028. Uh, Longer. Okay. Longer. But building up the process of digitization requires that much manpower at the moment. Then, mm -hmm. um, once the process uh, on how to do it is fully established and the workflow is established, then, um, so the pioneering work takes big teams. Um, the delivery is a secondary issue. And with, um, with Digitize down there, which I would encourage every viewer and listener to see, um, I mean, it's a big machine that mm -hmm. does it. Um, I mean, but that machine needs to be fed by eight people. The team around the machine that digitizes 5,000 insects per day um, is around, um, in the room, about 20, 20, 12 to 20 people. Um, but this big machine that is automated digitization is only 5% of the entire process because preparing the specimens um, and then especially the digital aftercare and the curation, the digital curation is what takes, what takes the time. So we started with open science. Well, and, digitization is open science, yes. And I want to end by coming around uh, to the start of the conversation again, even though this is also open science. A huge amount of effort has gone into educating the population and getting the population involved when it comes to climate science, uh, decreasing biodiversity and so forth. But it doesn't seem, at least from the outside, that nations are really taking these threats seriously. Yeah. And so I want to end with sort of two questions. These are, to start with, and I can remind you if, if you no, can't no. remember the two of them. The first one is, has open science worked? Has it been effective? Are we doing it right? And the second is very simple. Are you positive about the future? Are, are you? I, it, it's, for me, it's the same question. I'm very positive about the future because wherever you look, you see communities finding each other, developing for and around change. Mm -hmm. And so I'm turning 60 in a few months. And um, I'm interested in natural history probably all my life. But I joined the Natural History Society in Bielefeld, my hometown, either at the age of 12 or 14. I can't tell you exactly. And natural history society, so amateur naturalists, up until this very day, botany being the exception, but most other crafts, especially entomology, used to be male dominated. Paleontology, entomology, mineralogy. Botany was always, as I said, 50-50 what in terms of sex and citizen science where we have the European Citizen Science Association and all the stuff we do for Germany here right from the word go with the exception of me being the president basically it's all young women mm -hmm. so there's been a generational shift and a shift in outlook and perspective. And if you look at social entrepreneurship, if you look at business development, if you look at scientific leadership, if you look at amateur science, citizen science, open science, you see a very, very large percentage of, from me as a 60 year old, I would call young women. So from their, um, 30s to their mid 40s mm -hmm. the age when you can say i'm able ready and willing to take responsibility and these are the coalitions for change um that we have they are building up momentum everywhere this is also why it is quite frightening that 
for example, when you look at political debates around reproductive rights, old white men want to reassert their authority and power again. Um, but I think that is too late now. So, I mean, you see a number of issues in the United States currently, but I do not see that the demography um, will will follow this this type of trend. And um, especially here in Europe, um, from what I can see, especially in the open science, citizen science uh, movements, where I've been quite active and instrumental bringing it together, um, I see I see women um, taking the lead everywhere. And that um, will lead to different outcomes, different imaginations and different policies. Um, and so that's what we need to work with and support. That would be my my take and um, whatever role we can play. So when we started here, Stefan and I, so we were both appointed. Um, when we started here, the entire leadership team um, were 15 were 15 men. Um, at times there were three quarters women and um, one quarter men. Now it's uh, about 50-50 mm -hmm. in the leadership team. Um, there is fluctuation in all of this, but um, that's the way how the world swings. And I would argue the museum is a much better place, a much more relevant and um, yeah, m much more excellent place um, for it. And I think we are just one of the many, many examples where this change is mm. is happening. Um, so, yes, there's plenty of plenty of room um, for action and plenty of room for development and engagement. And that's what I would encourage. Hope can be hindrance to action. We have to be careful there. Um, it's action and engagement that matters now. And I think um, that's where we see the shift and the new coalitions. And if this museum um, and the other Leibniz research museums can play their part being conveners or even pacemakers for this mm -hmm. development, the better for us and perhaps for Germany. Can I, can I ask, so the... the what do you think of political protests? So, for example, the people who glued themselves to the exhibits here, do you find in general that, because Berlin in general is very political, yeah. so you can see a march every yeah. second week. Yeah. Do you think these are effective? Do you think it makes sense? Do you, do you think this is a viable form of political protest? It is part of the political system. I'm not an expert to tell you whether there's any... effectiveness in this. This is not my area of expertise. I'm sure there are studies who can talk about it. So with the climate activists, the climate activists, the, the, the Klimakleber, mm -hmm. um, basically followed a very successful pattern of the advertising industry. So if you look, for example, at Marlboro, mm -hmm. you see a smooth landscape, a beautiful landscape with just the right amount of green, um, a heroic figure and a toxic substance. So you basically um, um, juxtapose juxtaposition, mm -hmm. and that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And that's why they drew so much attention onto them. The activism of the climate activists here um, were one of our biggest. I mean, as I said, we had prepared for the response. So I mean. Um, it gave us the biggest press coverage um, last year. That we went straight onto the um, offensive um, with this issue and got our message across. And the feedback I got from the political system was enormous. Still until today, people turn around to me from the Bundestag or whatever and say, we've seen how all the other directors all the other museum directors talked about how concerned they are about their specimens. Mm. And I was the one who said, let's talk about the issue. Mm. And you can see what is the more democratic mm. approach. And I suppose, what is the point of, of a museum if it's not going to be a place for discussion, debate and learning? 
that is your point of view, that is my point of view, but it's not shared by a number of my colleagues, hmm. which I find completely bizarre. I mean, you are essentially providing the value of the universe, of, sorry, rather the museum to the population. Funny, isn't that hmm. what I'm being paid for? Hmm. What am I being paid for as a director? To deliver value. <laughs> so then let me ask this. One day, there's going to come a day when you're no longer the director. Yes, and I know already when that is. I'm not going to ask. <laughs> but I, I hope your tenure is long and uh, happy. But uh, how do you prepare the chair for when you leave? So how, how, do, you, how do you position... So one of so there are lots of myths and misconceptions about leadership in this world how many people do you think a person who wants to be a leader has to lead it depends on what you mean by the question so one <laughs> okay if you want to exercise leadership you have to lead yourself mm -hmm. you have to be you have to know yourself and you have to be in control of yourself. Okay? And what is the only job leaders have to do? Create other leaders. So this is why you've pushed off in the direction of education as opposed to... Because y you were a successful researcher uh, looking into the sex life of firms. And so at some point you decided to make the jump from individual research. I suppose, see, in, in my conception... With my research, I, I can have impact in my particular small area. I imagine, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I imagine the viewpoint that you may have taken is that by educating a large percentage of the population or, or acting in the role that you're currently in, your impact is in some sense magnified. <clears throat> is, is that the with me, With me, it was the other way around. So um, I not just joined the Natural History Society Bielefeld at the age of 12 or 14. I also became, um, I, I come from a sort of political family. Um, um, my father was active in the unions, my grandfather and his father were very active um, in, in, in the Social Democrats. Um, a strong Protestant upbringing um, of your daily work is your daily worship. Um, and I was always politically interested, as long as I would say I can think. Um, and so, um, originally actually, because then when I came out of the army, I, um, I became quite active and involved through the Natural History Society in, in political machinations in in Bielefeld, not not aligned to any political party, just sort of trying to give um, science-based advice um, on city developments and um, nature policies and so on and so forth. And um, so when I started studying, I actually wanted to study law um, rather than biology. Um, and I did both. And um, when I got the opportunity to, um, to go to Cambridge, um, to do genetics, um, I wanted to do that because I knew that the two areas where science, where biology and law overlapped, and which were really important issues, political as well as socially, were environmental issues and um, genetics, because sort of DNA technologies came along and one could already see that it was leading eventually, as it does now, to personalized medicine, all this type of stuff. And when I went to Cambridge, um, I, um, I went there um, telling them um, I, I want to be an active person, um, not necessarily in biology, but in, in the politics of science. Um, and that was one of the reasons why they were very keen to have me. And then um, when I got the um, uh, scholarship to do my PhD at Cambridge at the Natural History Museum in London, um, my supervisors knew that I actually had a political agenda. Um, but they said, look, in order for you 
to get agency, um, first of all, you need to have a substantial body of um, scientific excellence and evidence um, behind you because whatever you want to do, that is what nobody will ever be able to take away from you. Um, so, in a way, um, I was educated um, and I also um, made steps myself um, to do the job I do now. I have been trained to do this job mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to do this job. I mean, whether it's in Berlin, London or God knows where, it's a completely different issue. Um, but I've done all the stuff, including management school and all this type of stuff, um, coaching, um, mm. done lots of mistakes, um, <laughs> got my bloody nose, um, dusted myself off um, and um, did it better next time. So, no, this is deliberate. This is not an accident. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so the science bit was actually um, the necessary bit to do the stuff that I do now. And, of course, the other thing uh, is um, honing the skills of storytelling because that's how humans communicate and and work with each other. And if you have these marvelous objects with mm. these marvelous stories, um, what more do you need? So my cardboard box is basically my box of goodies and treasures and um, endless stories. I didn't expect that answer. Can, can I ask then, do you think in general that scientists make good politicians? As, as in, what is the place that scientists really play in, in politics? Are they just advisors? Or? This is an issue of character, isn't it? You, you, there's no generalization. Mm -hmm. I had the idea of being politically active in inverted commas, which I've been a lot. I've been on advisory committees in the UK, but seriously, um, I've been in advisory committees here in Germany for for the German government, um, for the EU, and so on and so forth. Um, and while I may have had the inkling of doing stuff like that, doing science-based advice, um, when I was about 21 or 22, no, that's, I, I did it already then for Bielefeld. Um, um, I was nowhere near, I, I nowhere near had the agency that I have now. You know, it's really this bizarre thing, 10,000 hours of practice. Yeah? Mm. I mean, you've asked me earlier on whether I did these type of things before. In a normal week, I would argue I give at least one interview, but probably three or four public performances. Mm -hmm. And I've done this now since I've been here, so 11 years. I've done my eleven, my, my 10,000 hours of public performance um, a few times over by now. Mm. Um, and funnily enough, I think the storytelling gets a little bit better, but stories, the essence is basically... <laughs> It's basically the same. I read I read the interview I gave with Die Zeit um, more or less the day I arrived. Unbelievable. Still the same stuff we talked about today. Mm. It is timeless, this type of stuff. I mean, I, I embellish it differently these days, but it's basically the same stuff. But then there are changes, right? So, for instance, one of the things that's big in the news at the moment is artificial intelligence. We yeah. have GTP3, GTP4, yeah. uh, these new agents that are coming out. And so one, one of the things that I worry about is the confidence with which, if you ask ChatGTP a question about science or a question about politics or a question <coughs> about anything, it will answer very confidently, even if the content is completely wrong. And so this is relevant to our discussion yeah. because today, you can see the citations. If you go and you read a Wikipedia article, you can you can see the chain of citations and you can go, oh, look where th this bit of information came from. Maybe people can put some some misinformation, some disinformation, but ultimately you can follow the, the chain. The trail. Yeah. Whereas 
we might we might be entering a strange uh, place in society where all of a sudden we have Google or Microsoft or some trusted entity that has an agent which is telling you things with the utmost confidence um, and you just believe it without any chance of seeing the citations and and so I, I'm wondering um, okay so so one of the game the, the big game that you play is 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 public science and, and educating uh, the population do you have a chance because you know <laughs> I mean, back, I, I'm, come, I'm, I'm, look, look, comes back to the same argument. Science is missing the trick of engaging with the public about the process of science. Mm. We can immunize society. We can immunize society against chat bot 10. Mm. But it means efforts on our part yesterday mm. and we are not doing it because science is self-serving in its own reference system mm. in general and this needs to change on saturday big article in the financial times exactly about what you were saying that we have now entered the dark ages and that we need immediately and ethics, they even were talking about um, closing the systems down because it will be so destructive to democracy. But what is the argument? The argument is the big Microsoft, Google, God knows what, are in competition with each other and with China. So therefore, we are destroying democracy. The same argument goes in Minx populations, we now know that this new bird flu strain is going between mammals and it also can jump from there to humans. Nobody is getting rid of all the minks. Why do we need minks farming? When we have a bird flu strain there that could kill one in three people. It, it makes me mad, this type of stuff, because it is really sleep walking towards the cliff. And all for supposedly shareholder value or God knows what. And who is having to pick up the tap? You and me, society, our children. Hmm. And at the same time, in a democracy, we even have the pleasure to vote for this, hmm. like many others. And science is not doing its job engaging with society to create the majority for rationale, reason, and science-based um, uh, addressing the challenges of the future. And mm -hmm. that's where I think it becomes now very, very dangerous. For science mm -hmm. itself, science is pulling the rug from underneath its feet if it continues to act like that. Now, here in Germany, a lot of my scientific colleagues when challenged like this, will say, but it is in our constitution that science is free. Yes, studied enough law to know that it is deeply enshrined in the first few paragraphs of our constitution. Mm. I totally agree. But what it doesn't say in our constitution is whether a finance minister has to finance science. Mm. So you dream your dreams, but if a parliament decides not to fund science, you can be as free as a bird. Good luck. Do you think though that sort of the, so one of the dreams that I have is, one of the things that I'm interested in is seeing whether it's possible to use science outreach to fund research itself. So at universities, for instance, <laughs> what researchers do, and you're aware of this, is they, in some sense, trade their time with the university in order to do research. So they say, you know, X number of days a week, I'm going to be teaching, doing an administration, whatever it is. And in exchange, I'm allowed to now look at this abstract uh, issue that I'm personally interested yeah. in. And so one of the things I want to know is, is it possible 
to change that dynamic, to change where you're selling your time to in order to do research. So you, this is why I asked you the question, how much time do you personally get to do research, misunderstanding the path that you took into your current position? But I was genuinely curious with the question because I want to know, for instance, whether you think it's possible um, to to create <coughs> outreach, you have a podcast as well, an outreach program which generates funding, separates separates uh, scientists from the government in a certain sense, and is protective so that, such that they can work on the problems that they think are valuable without someone turning off the 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 hose, so to speak. Yes, yes, I believe in that. That that is possible. Um, I mean. You should have asked Steve Jobs about that, not me, because he's commercialized um, most of human desires now incredibly successfully. I should have known about that earlier. I could have bought some shares. Apple shares. Um, um, th there are ways to do that, I'm pretty sure. Um, in Germany, we are still very lucky that there is a consensus amongst, I would argue, 85% of members of parliament that science is a public good in itself and needs to be funded mm -hmm. for that. Um, and that, at this stage, I'd say is the best route. Whether the question that I got slightly irate about earlier on is whether I think that science is doing the right stuff with that trust and that money. Um, but that's debatable. Okay, I would say we have to invest 20% into stabilizing or working with people and democracy. Um, others may disagree with that. <laughs> um, so um, yes, you can commercialize things. But as we all know, starting to build commercial ventures costs a lot of energy um, in the first place. And we have in science already a system that is equally bizarre. It's called external funding, where um, vast amounts of treasure, time, energy and resources is spent writing applications with a five or six percent success rate. So that means that six times as many efforts go down the drain. Mm. Yeah, And, and one, sometimes these take a month to write. More. More. Mm. I've been not unsuccessful in obtaining external funding mm. um, in various parts of what I cared about. And I would argue three years is a good lead time to be successful in a grant. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the last six months is then hell on earth to hone it in and do the networking and contacting. But three years, I would argue, is a good time from developing an idea to actually getting the treasure. Hmm. And even as a normal employee, as a scientist here in Germany, um, three years, now it's not full time, but three years of a scientist plus the associated costs is already, if it were full time, um, nearly twice as much as you can hope to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a null sum game. And the alternative, as you know, is lottery draw. So that basically everybody submits their application Somebody just scans through and says, this is voodoo, this has a scientific base, not more, and then luck off the draw um, to get drawn. That is a much more effective system and it would dispense much less treasure. It's more egalitarian. It's more egalitarian, would spend, expend much less treasure um, on writing grant on, applications on writing, and reading them. On writing and reading them. But yeah. I, I would argue there's another way though. I would argue that in Germany in particular, we have a system where there are very few permanent jobs. The ratio of permanent jobs to short-term positions is very low. In universities, it's 
ridiculous. And if you changed this ratio, then there would necessarily be less grant writing, right? Yes, but also, so again, I mean, just today, the the federal ministry published a blueprint for the new um, um, labor laws governing science. Um, the thing that I'm worried about is um, if you create more permanent jobs, you have less jobs for people that follow. Hmm. Yes, science is bloody hard business. So we have 60 PhD students here. Let's say they take on average four years. So that means 15 per year we would release into the wild, so to speak, with a degree that certifies that they are able to conduct science independently. That's mm -hmm. a PhD in Germany. How many science positions do I have every year permanent? If you're Luckily, lucky, two. one, two. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So that means um, we are releasing um, 13, 14 people per year with no prospect of a job at this place. And most of them love this place and would love mm -hmm. to work here. And I, I imagine they're very if, good as well. But they're excellent. That's why they're here. But if I would employ them all, imagine how quick the entire world would have a German science contract. <laughs> yeah, do the math. Yeah. If every German institution with all the 500,000 or whatever students or whatever millions of students we have, I know 500,000 is the number of people employed in science in Germany. I mean, you would have the entire world population being a German scientist probably in 12 generations, you know? Hmm. I mean, nothing wrong with being a German scientist and being on a German scientist salary, you know, but there are other things that need to be done in this world. So... It so is your a, argument it is, is you mugs, it is an absolute mugs game. It's an absolute mugs game, um, science. And you can be the most brilliant scientist in your field that the world has ever seen. If there isn't a portion of lack, luck, um, yeah, nobody will ever, nobody will ever discover. Yeah, and then you have a few icons like Darwin or Einstein, who do their groundbreaking work on their own money in their own spare time. You know, but that's probably because they were so brilliant, because they were not in a scientific contract. Yeah, one worked in a patent office in Switzerland and the other had um, investments and family money um, to do as he, as he wished. And also, as we know from Charles Darwin, his degree was theology. Yeah, mm. um, he was an amateur scientist and he's probably... Um, the most groundbreaking scientist um, biology or natural science has ever seen in the world, you know? So I, you're in a difficult position in the sense that you have a large collection. <coughs> and so you need a lot of eyes to go over the, it's, it, it's just a, a mass, the mass with which you need to work with yeah. means that you need to have a certain number of PhDs yeah. in here. It's the same for large organizations like yeah. CERN. They, yeah. they have huge yeah. numbers of people on yeah. all their papers. Yeah. But there, it is really field dependent. There, there are fields where. So I would not argue that you are being exploitative in this position. It, it's just a numbers game. It's required um, here. But there are positions which I would argue are being exploitative, and yeah, um, and it's because. But don't forget. So I have grant in aid. So grant in aid means that with us the level of permanent staff is way over 50%. Mm -hmm. It's not like 3% in universities or whatever low figures they have there. Here it's over 50% because we have exactly as you say, we need to have, we are an infrastructure organization. The, the bizarre thing about natural history museums is we, we are all seen through the eyes of the visitors, the dinosaur displays or God knows what. And then we work a lot trying to be recognized as excellent science institutions. But at the core, we are infrastructure organizations like CERN. Mm. We provide an infrastructure to conduct scientific research. And for that, I get grant in aid. 
And for that, I need to employ permanent mm-hmm. staff. Mm-hmm. And the public and the science is basically, one might want to argue, a bit of an add-on. But the interesting thing is, in order for us to conduct the work that we now can digitize our infrastructure, comes from the love of the public and the excellence of the science. Mm-hmm. So that's the juggling that we need to do all of the time. And in this organization, there's a very mature understanding of the interdependencies of these three areas. Mm -hmm. They all once in a while claim superiority and say, oh, with us you wouldn't be, and with us you wouldn't be, and we are more important than you. Mm -hmm. But it's all bollocks. (laughs) Because we are being successful because the different parts, yes, they are in competition, um, Mm -hmm. but in the end, We work towards joint, shared goals and ambitions. And that's basically then the job of the leadership team to negotiate that. But for that, we have grant and aid. For that, we are a mission-driven organization. Mm. So that means I cannot go and say, now we do plastic surgery research because there's more money in it than in looking at paleobotany. Yeah, Mm. Um, That's not in my mission. If I were a university, yes, I could turn out Barbies um, yeah, and make millions on that one if it's just fashionable. But do you think it's by construction that universities... So do you think it's to the benefit of Germany, for instance, that universities do churn out large number of PhDs? Yes. Who, okay, because you see that as educating the population yes. and producing... Yes, definitely. So in Germany... We have about 500,000 people working in science, and we estimate that about 500,000 people, so the same amount, are active as amateur naturalists or at, at, amateur scientists. So that's, that's a huge amount of people. And that is, that is a privilege of a number of um, northern western uh, societies. Sweden is big, UK, uh, mm. Benelux, uh, France, huge numbers of highly educated people using scientific thinking but um, working in other professions. Well, can I ask then, because at the start of the conversation you said that you had, you often interacted with and collaborated with African colleagues, for instance, yeah. people from yeah. uh, across the continent. And so I, I'm wondering, they must also come here on, say, postdoc positions or PhD yeah. positions. What happens to those people after they finish off their tenure, not just here, but also, you're also at Humboldt, right? So do they tend to go back to their home countries? Or I'm asking this question because I'm wondering about the benefit to Germany of the current structure. <coughs> so for, there is a global competition for the best minds. And of course, we are in that game. Mm. And um, one of the measures, directly and indirectly, So the more diverse a team is, um, there are indications that that they become more successful the more diverse they are. So our biodiversity team now um, has, as far as I understand, I mean, I don't get me, I mean, I may quote the figures wrong, but it's a team of about 30 with 14 different nations now from Mm. South America, North America, uh, Asia, Europe, I don't know whether Africa is in there as well, at least four mm-hmm. continents. Mm-hmm. Um, are we trying to take the best people f- from these, if they fit in? Yes. Mm-hmm. Will they go back? Well, perhaps, I don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, there's an exchange. Science is an exchange. And yes, um, the West, America, um, very successfully Switzerland, very successfully Germany with its stupid rules and regulations, not that successfully attracting international Mm -hmm. talent. Um, That's just the the game it is. I mean, China is full of Western scientists in top positions. Um, They've Mm -hmm. played that game very Mm -hmm. successfully. Thousand thousand talent programs they run um, were open to Westerners and they came in droves. So... um, is it desirable for them to go back? Um, I mean, as far as I understand, in entrepreneurship, 
um, a lot of people who cut their cloth, especially women in America and, for example, the UK, um, have now gone back mm -hmm. to Africa to establish businesses there, and they see it as their duty to do so. Um, how that is in science, I can't, I can't tell you, but um, especially with this Museums Lab program, um, there hasn't been any discussions about them. Um, yes, they may want to come for a year mm. or something like that, but mm. as far as I can see, they're very, very much committed to their institutions and their countries like um, I am mm -hmm. to this, or I, I would say I'm, I'm rather wedded to Europe than to a particular country. Um, but um, yeah, so, mm. you know, life, life stories um, are difficult, difficult mm. to judge. Um, yes, conditions. I mean, look, Germany now has this huge push uh, to recruit uh, from the world because we are running out of skilled labor and we are, we are becoming an aging population. I'm born in 63. That is the peak of birth rate in German, in German history. So people like me sooner or later um, need need help um, and um, there are plenty of us around so Germany runs this enormous recruitment drive they want to attract potentially up to 1.3 million people per year to come to Germany um, to fill the shortages shortages in labor um, and one of the trademarks Germany wants to go out into the world is security so you yeah. are Secure, you and your family are secure and safe in Germany. Mm. And to a very, very large degree, yes, we hear about horrible, despicable attacks um, on people because of their race or color or whatever. But um, in general, um, Germany provides a safe, secure um, environment to bring up families um, from all creeds. And um, I think that's that's not a bad USP um, for Germany to mm. uh, to work with. So, yeah, but it's it's a it's a difficult thing. At the same time, um, in this globalized world and in this world that has so many challenges ahead, be it climate, be it social justice, be it resources, be it biodiversity, um, um, we need to have empowered communities wherever. Mm -hmm. wherever they are. So um, a balance needs to be found there. Mm. I suppose there is value itself <laughs> in the connections. I should I should let you <laughs> I should let you wrap nah, up. No, we talk for another two hours. 